and we'll get started. So I'm going to first introduce who you're going to be hearing from today. Um, you won't be hearing that much from me. I'm just here to, to watch things going. But I'm Katie, and I work at the Langley Well Center, which is part of the ORCA network. Um, and then I'll pass it off to you, Tiffany. I'm Tiffany, and I'm the Programs Assistant for ORCA Network in the Langley Whale Center. And I'll pass it to Patrick, our guest. Hi, everybody. <laughs> my name is Patrick. My pronouns are he, him, and I uh, am the Community Engagement Coordinator, so I help uh, manage the volunteers at SR3, which is a sea life hospital for um, ocean creatures. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for joining us. And then also Cindy is here as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Cindy. I do education programs for Orca Network. Good to see all of you. And this is my cat. She's joining us today. <laughs> she wants to learn about turtles. All right. So um, just a couple things before we get going, like I had said, but just in case you weren't logged in yet, um, please change your name to the name that you would like to be called today on your screen. Um, also, we are recording this to put on YouTube um, on our youth event channel so that we can watch them again. And then I think I'm ready to pass it off to Tiffany and Patrick for your awesome presentation today. You'll, you'll hear from me later when we do our activity. So that was another reminder that I should have said. Um, I sent everybody a worksheet, but if you didn't print, print it out, that's okay. You can always print it out later and do that worksheet. All right, off to you, Tiffany. Okay, um, oh, I'm gonna I have one, sorry, <laughs> I did forget one thing. <laughs> um, if you have questions, we're just gonna ask that everybody stay on mute while um, Tiffany and Patrick present today, um, just because it, um, it's easier for them to talk if there are interruptions. But if you have questions or comments, you can put them in the chat box or raise your hand and we'll call on you. Okay, now it's off. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so if I could just get a thumbs up, um, once it's showing, okay. Um, am I good? Looks, looks okay. great, Tiffany. All right. Yeah. Um, so here's a cool video that, uh, Jeannie, the assistant manager at the Laneley Whale Center's friend shared, um, of a sea turtle underwater. And this is actually what we're going to be learning about today. Um, so what are sea turtles? Uh, they're reptiles. And what are reptiles? They're um, animals that have dry skin with scales, two sets of legs, a set of lungs, and they lay eggs. Um, and some might say that sea turtles are dinosaurs, but they're actually prehistoric reptiles because they did live um, alongside the dinosaurs over 200 million years ago. Um, a good example is uh, Archaon, who is a uh, sea turtle that the remains were found in South Dakota in 1895. And he was named Archelon, meaning the ruling turtle. And he was a prehistoric reptile. And um, he was believed to be 12 feet and a whopping 4,000 pounds. He must be, have been huge. And then we have seven species of sea turtles. Uh, we have the Kemp's Ridley, the Olive Ridley, the Hawksbill, the Flatback, the Green, the Loggerhead, and the Leatherback. Um, and they're very different in many ways, and we'll learn about that in a little bit. Um, but first, we're going to talk about some of their similarities. Um, so they have pretty similar life cycles. They all begin as eggs, and after about 45 to 70 days, depending on the species, they'll hatch. Um, and then they'll race out to the ocean, um, and they'll spend a couple, um, or they'll spend the first about 10 years of their life out there following the ocean currents and feeding on small invertebrates and insects. And as they grow up a little bit, um, they start to move to shallow water and there they'll continue growing until they reach adulthood. Um, and then, and this depends on, or varies on the species, but after about 15 to 50 years of maturing, they'll start to breed and they'll start longer migrations. Um, and then the female sea turtles will go back to their natal beach, so the beach that they were hatched on, um, and they'll lay eggs every two to five years. 
Um, they all share a similar anatomy. Um, they have the top part of their shell, which is the carapace, and they have the lower part, which is the plastron. Um, so the top part will typically be a darker color. And this is so that when you have predators that are looking um, down um, from above them in the water, they'll blend in with the sea floor. And when they're looking from below them um, up at the turtle, they'll blend in with the light. So they're kind of camouflaged. And the shell is actually bones fused together. So it's the rib cage, sternum, vertebrae. Um, and those bones are spongy, meaning they kind of have little holes through them. And this helps them float. And on their shells, they have keratin, or they have scutes, um, which are actually made of keratin, just like that in your fingertips and the baleen of baleen whales. They have uh, two sets of flippers, and on those flippers, they have scales. And they have nostrils, um, and the, they rely heavily on a good sense of smell um, because their eardrums are actually covered by skin, so they don't have any ear holes. And they don't have teeth, they actually have a beak. Um, and this is so that they can uh, chew and break things open. And lastly, they have a tail. Um, and for males, the tail will be longer, females are shorter. Um, leatherbacks are a little bit different. Um, they actually lack a hard shell. Um, so their carapace is flexible. It's made of a cartilage-like tissue and this helps them dive further and move a little bit easier. Um, so for adaptations and movements, um, sometimes you might see a sea turtle and say, is he crying? Um, no, he's actually just getting rid of some extra salt through his salt glands. Um, he has, they have front flippers and this will help propel them through the water and the back flippers will help them steer. And they actually don't have head and um, they actually don't have a head and feet that retract into their shell like land turtles. Um, and this is kind of a cool photo. Um, some of the species have what you call their throat spines, and this helps them swallow the food, and um, it keeps it from coming back up. Um, where are sea turtles? Uh, if you look at this map here, they're just about everywhere. That is with the exception of Arctic waters, um, and that's because they're cold-blooded. So they need warm water. Um, and cold-blooded means that the temperature of their body matches that of the environment. So if it's cold, they're cold, and if it's warm, they're warm. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm talking to you from, um, we're here in the Salish Sea. Um, so that's the body of water that it, um, is combined with uh, BC and water of Canada and water by Washington. Um, and the average temperature doesn't get above 50 degrees Fahrenheit um, with the exception of a couple summer months. Um, and the leatherback sea turtles are actually the only species that can swim in water that reaches below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The other ones are actually at risk of being cold stunned. Um, the leatherbacks, they're able to generate a little bit of body heat and they have an extra layer of fat that keeps them a little bit warmer. Um, occasionally we will see green, olive ridley, loggerhead and leatherback sea turtles up here in Washington, however. Um, nesting of sea turtles is a really interesting thing. Um, depending on the species, they'll lay 50 to 200 eggs. Um, and this will be several times um, every two to five years. And after about 45 to 70 days, they'll hatch. They'll hatch a little bit quicker if it's hotter outside. Um, and when they hatch, if you look at this picture here and follow my cursor, um, they have a little temporary tooth called a carbuncle. And so there's this little point sticking out and that helps them break open the shell. And the sex of each um, turtle will depend on the temperature. So the cooler temperatures will make male um, hatchlings and the warmer temperatures will make female. Um, so the ones that are a little bit lower in the nest will typically be male. And the ones that are a little bit higher in the nest will be female. And it's estimated that only one out of a thousand hatchlings will actually make it to adulthood. 
Um, so here's a really cool video that a friend of mine shared. It's a um, olive ridley turtle out of Costa Rica and it came to lay its nest during the night. Um, we used a red light to capture the video because uh, turtles are very sensitive to light um, and red lights uh, have shorter waves. So they're supposed to not stress turtles out as much. Um, and here the turtle came and you can see it dug a really deep hole about two to five feet with its back flippers. Um, the eggs are, they don't have a typical hard shell like those in your fridge. Um, they're a little bit rubbery, uh, rubbery and that way they can bounce easier when they land. Um, and after about 45 to 70 days, that this is when they'll start to make their way from the nest. Um, so at this stage, they've used their carbuncle, they've cracked open their egg, and they all start to go out to the sea together. Um, and right away, they'll see some scary predators. They'll see crabs and birds. Um, and this is one of my favorite things to watch, videos and in person. Um, it it kind of shows how fearless those little turtles are. Um, they came out of their nest and the first thing they see is a lot of different things trying to eat them and crashing waves, but they head out to that water fearlessly. Um, so after that, we kind of have a lot of information that isn't known about turtles. It's called the lost years actually, um, because it's up to about 20 years for some species where there's just a not, lot, not a lot known about where they go, what they're doing. Um, and throughout the years, we started to have more research done, a little bit better technology to try to understand what is happening and what they're doing. Um, and they have been able to um, find that a couple of the species are following ocean currents and some are out hiding in sargassum seabeds or other types of algae or seaweed beds um, to hide away from predators. Um, once they get older and they start migrating, um, all the species will migrate except for the flatbacks. Um, and they'll do this every couple of years. So they migrate from their foraging or their feeding grounds um, to where they're going to nest. And that is their natal beach or the beach of which they were born. And it's still um, being researched on how they know how to go back to or how to find their, their natal beach after so many years. Um, but the simplest way to say it is they have an internal compass and they somehow just instinctively know where to go. Um, this is a really cool map showing a leatherback sea turtle that nested all the way here in Indonesia and made its way um, up to Oregon, which is a distance of about 12,774 miles, um, which is a really long ways for a little turtle. Um, and we are able to track this because they've done some tagging and research um, throughout the years. And they have different types of tags. They have these, which um, we have metal and we have plastic ones. Um, they have letters and numbers um, and they just, they clip onto their front flippers. Um, we have PIT tags, which are passive integrative transponder tags. And those are injected underneath the skin. And then we have satellite tags. Um, so a little bit more about each type of uh, sea turtle. We have the Kemp's Ridley, um, which will weigh up to 100 pounds and be two feet long. Um, it has a distinctive triangular head and an olive green or gray carapace or the top part of its shell and a yellow plastron um, or the lower part of its shell. Um, and they like sandy, muddy bottoms for water. And that's because they feed primarily on crabs. And they are migrators um, that begin nesting at the age of 15. And they have three clutches every one to three years. Um, about 95% of their nests occur in Mexico. And I'll show you a cool picture in a minute. Um, they nest in a, in a cool thing called aribadas. Um, and then the olive ridley, which is closely related to the Kemp's ridley, um, gets a little bit longer at 2.5 feet. Um, and weighs up to 100 pounds also. Um, it's my favorite species of sea turtle actually. Um, it has a heart-shaped carapace and an, that's an olive grayish color. 
And it's typically found in the coastal bays and estuaries, but they also like to spend a lot of time in the open ocean. And they're not very picky eaters, they're omnivores, meaning they'll eat the meat and the greens. They like algae and lobsters and crabs and more. And they're migrators, migrators as well. Um, they begin nesting around the age of 15 and commonly in groups called aribatas. Um, so like I said, I'd show you a picture. This is the what the Kemp's Ridley and Olive Ridley is. Um, it's their own distinct way of nesting. It's an event where thousands of female turtles without, um, throughout the course of a couple of weeks will make their way um, to the same beach and nest at the same time. We also have the hawksbill sea turtle, um, and this is up to 200 pounds, three feet long, um, and they get to be, or they have this uh, pointed beak, just like a hawk, which is where the name came from, and they have a beautiful tortoise shell pattern on the top of their carapace. They're found in estuaries, lagoons, and coral reefs um, throughout uh, the different um, parts of the world. And they're omnivores as well, but they mainly eat sponges. They love their sponges. And they too are migrators that will begin nesting around the years of 25 years old to 35 years old. We have flatback sea turtles, um, and these get up to about 200 pounds, three and a half feet long. And they have a much flatter carapace or top part of their shell than the other species. Um, and a white plastron or underneath part of their shell. And they like inshore water, so coral reefs, grassy, grassy shallow water, um, but they're found, if you look at this map down in the corner, in a very limited range um, on planet Earth. So they're just right here where this purple is um, by Papua New Guinea and Australia. And they like sea cucumbers, jellyfish, mollusks, prawns, um, other invertebrates, and seaweed. And they're the one species that they do not migrate. Um, they, they know where home is and they kind of stay there. And they average four nests per season every couple of years. Um, and they have the smallest nest, so only about 50 eggs on average. But their hatchlings and eggs are a little bit larger than the other species. Um, we have loggerheads, which are up to 400 pounds, three feet long. And they have a carapace that is a reddish brown and a yellow bottom part of their shell or plastron. And they got their name because they have big round log like heads. And they like near shore coral reefs, bays, and estuaries and are found throughout the globe. And they like the benthic zone or bottom zone invertebrates, such as crabs, mollusks, and they will occasionally eat some jellyfish. And they are known to migrate some over 7,500 miles. And they don't start nesting until around the age of 45 years old. Um, the last couple we have, we have the green. Um, which will range from 200 to 400 pounds, three to four feet long. And it has a beautiful brown modeled marking um, for the top part of its shell or the carapace. And they're typically yellowish um, below on their plastron. And some are known to have a black actually top part of their shell. And they're in tropical and subtropical waters. Um, and often seen in eel grass beds and coral reefs. And they love their greens, they're herbivores. So they eat a lot of eel grass and algae blooms and they're migrators as well. Um, and they don't start nesting until around 20 to 50 years of age. Um, we have the leatherback lastly, um, which is up to a whopping 2000 pounds. And, six feet long. Um, so it's half a foot longer than me, <laughs> how tall I am. And um, it weighs a lot. So they get massive. Um, they have a tear shaped body, um, no claws on their flippers, uh, and a thick, dark, leathery skin. Um, as we mentioned before, um, they have that soft carapace, not the hard shell like the other species. And they're common more so in the open ocean, 
Um, they can tolerate a little bit colder water. So they've been seen as far north as Alaska. And they're known for long migration, some over 10,000 miles. Um, and they almost exclusively eat jellyfish. They really love their jellyfish. And as far as nesting goes, it's about five to seven nests every two to three years. So that means about for one season, so within one year, um, five to seven nests. And that occurs every um, couple of years. So if we look back at the slide where we have all the species, um, we might ask, how are they doing? Sadly, it's not so well. Um, right now, they are all currently listed as either threatened, endangered, or critically endangered. And this is because they face a lot of predators and threats. Um, as soon as they hatch, they right away, the first thing they see when they come out is crabs and vultures, um, a lot of predators on the beach and out in the open ocean, they're facing predators. Um, as they get older, they face sharks and the occasional killer whale. Um, plastic and pollution is a huge threat for sea turtles. Um, the leatherbacks rely um, on feeding mainly on jellyfish and those plastic bags floating out in the ocean look a lot like jellyfish. Um, light pollution is another threat for sea turtles. Um, when the sea, baby sea turtles do hatch, oftentimes they'll use, their use the light of the moon to find their way to the open ocean. And sometimes they get misled by those city lights and they get lost. Uh, climate change is another one. Um, those nests are very sensitive. Um, as I mentioned before, um, with warmer temperatures, you might end up with more nests that are just all female, which isn't good for the breeding and um, ultimately can affect the populations. And sadly, one of the biggest threats is people. Um, it's, we are the ones that have caused a lot of the pollution. Um, we've built on their beaches, their nesting beaches. They've been hunted by people in the past and poached, um, the eggs have been poached. Um, and we've done a lot to try to, to, try to change that, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and another effect that people have is our fishing gear. Um, a lot of turtles get trapped in different fishing nets um, and a lot of turtles do get hit by fishing boats as well. Why do we care? Um, you know, sea turtles are called the lawnmowers of the sea and that's because they help keep the sea grass healthy. Um, just like how the grass in your yard needs to be mowed to stay healthy, um, so does sea grass. And it's really important for the ecosystem. Um, and sea turtles are a huge um, aspect of keeping that healthy. Uh, another way is the eggs and eggshells help provide nutrients uh, for the ecosystems and they help vegetation growth, which um, helps erosion or helps prevent erosion. And then lastly, um, they help keep coral reefs healthy. Um, coral reefs grow slowly. Sea sponge populations can grow rapidly and uh, um, species such as the hawksbill help, help control those sea sponge populations, so ultimately help keep the coral reefs healthy. Uh, what has been done already? Um, there's been a lot of effort and we've seen a lot of improvement in the populations throughout the years. Um, one thing is TEDs, which are turtle excluder devices. Um, as you can see in this picture, there's just this little escape route uh, to keep turtles from getting caught in nets. Uh, we have monofilament recycling, um, which are these weird tubes you might see on your local beach. Um, they actually serve a really important purpose, and that is to help recycle line um, that's used for fishing. And we have different con conservation programs. Um, so in this picture, you see some uh, turtle nests that are actually being protected. Um, and that's due to different conservation programs um, that are working to try to increase the chance of the hatchlings making it out to the ocean. And we have marine animal response teams. Um, so this is a really cool photo. Um, it's from, you might remember about a year ago um, in Texas, they had a cold storm that kicked in and there were thousands of sea turtles that got cold stunned. 
uh, meaning that they couldn't move their muscles. They almost, they went immobile because um, they were so cold. And a group of incredible people worked a lot, a lot of long, hard hours to save them. And they managed to save over 5,000 um, sea turtles. What can you do? Um, no matter where you live, whether you live um, by the ocean or um, by the mountains, you can re reuse and recycle, keep that plastic out of the ocean. Um, use less chemicals in your home and yard. Um, ultimately, um, everything ends up in the ocean that goes down your drain. Um, you can leash your pets on the beach. And this doesn't only protect sea turtles, it protects other wildlife, um, such as our northern elephant seal population that we have here in Washington. Um, you can help protect uh, different animals by keeping your dog leashed. You can walk or ride your bike instead of driving. And you can clean up trash near rivers or on beaches. And lastly, you can tell your friends. Um, tell them what you learned today. Tell them about what's going on with the sea turtles. And maybe you guys can come up with a plan to help them yourselves. Um, I really quick just wanted to tell you too that volunteering is another um, way that you can help someday. I was lucky enough um, to join IVHQ when I was a senior in high school. Um, and I went to Ostianel, Costa Rica, um, and we got to tag, count eggs, uh, help measure turtles, collect data and notes, and help protect them from predators and poachers. Um, so at night, we would just walk the beaches, and like that video I showed you, we'd have red lights um, to not scare the turtles, but we would collect really important data that helps with research. Um, and it's just a really cool opportunity while I was there. Um, I just thought I'd share because three-toed sloths are pretty cute, <laughs> but um, tons of other wildlife while I was there. Uh, but it's an amazing way to be able to help out and someday you can volunteer too. Um, if you do ever see a turtle and it's caught in a net or it needs help, um, nationwide there are stranding networks and response teams that um, this one here is for the West Coast region, um, but if you look up, there should be somebody who um, has the expertise to be able to go and help them. And the wisdom of the turtle, just keep moving forward. Um, I'm about to introduce uh, Patrick in a second, but I just wanna end with a note that um, it's sad what's going on with the turtles. Um, there's threatened, endangered, and critically endangered. Uh, but they've been around since the time of the dinosaurs, um, and that's because they keep moving forward and, and they prosper through. So we can do the same and we can help them and we can see a better tomorrow. Um, so if you guys have any questions, um, you can, we'll take a second to open um, up for questions before we introduce Patrick and his special guest. Oh, thanks so much, Tiffany. So we did have one up in the chat. Um, and I don't know enough about turtles, but one of them was a veggie eater. So this question was about the one that said adults were herbivores, but what about their babies? That's a good question. Um, the babies actually, they'll feed more on small invertebrates and insects. Um, so they're more carnivorous when they're younger. Um, and for some of the species, like I mentioned, as they get older, they'll switch food over to jellyfish or sponges. Uh, but for the green, sea turtles. Uh, they love their greens as they get older. Awesome. Does anybody else have questions? You can do the raise your hand feature or put it in the chat. We'll give it just a couple more minutes before we move on to Patrick. That was a lot of information. Good job. Oh, here we got one. Why do some turtles only eat certain things? Um, that's because, so we all have our own niche. Like if you see birds in a tree, um, sometimes you'll, you'll go, how are they all coexisting? And that's because they'll all eat something different. Um, so they call it a niche and it keeps it from them from having conflict. Um, so they're all able to kind of hang out in the same region. They don't have to compete for food because they're eating something different. Um, that's, that's one reason. And it's kind of, it's, it's just like any other, um, just like you guys, you know, it's, it's how you're, you grow up. Sometimes it's just, it's part of who you are. It's part of who they are. They, 
they, this was what they know to eat. Awesome. Um, and then we have, uh, how old do sea turtles grow to be? I'm assuming, yeah. Um, that depends on the species. There's a lot of information that's still being learned with research. Um, there's some species uh, such as the olive ridley and the kemps where they seem to average more around 50 to 60 years. Um, but there have been some that have been recorded to live over a hundred. That's awesome. I think oh. that's, um, I think that's what, um, the guy, the turtle dude from Finding Nemo said. <laughs> yep. <laughs> a lot of good information in that movie. Yeah, there is. <laughs> well, I think we should move along to Patrick because he's got some awesome stuff to share with us. And if you have more questions, we can also take questions at the end of Patrick's part too. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my section. So that was a really, really cool overview of all the different kinds of sea turtles out there, all the different aspects of some of their biology and their behavior, and some really great anatomy stuff. Um, what we're going to do now is learn the story of just one single sea turtle. And uh, her name is Shy Shy. And she is a sea turtle that lives right here in the same facility that I work at. And then we're actually going to go out and see Shy Shy on my phone. Uh, she's in a pool right now. She was getting some treatments, but um, we had to stop those. So things change rapidly around here. But we'll go take a look so that you actually get to meet a sea turtle today, which is pretty cool. Um, can everybody give me either a Zoom reaction or some excited hands if you're stoked to meet a sea turtle today? Yeah, OK. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So um, Shy Shy is a green sea turtle. Oh, we got some thumbs up. I see a nice heart there. Very nice. So Shy Shy is a green sea turtle. And uh, Shy Shy got her name from the place where she was found. So I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see I a map? Love, I love green sea turtles. Oh, awesome. Well, I think this will be an, a very exciting opportunity for you, Caden. Um, so. Can everybody see this map? Give me either some jazz hands or some thumbs ups uh, if you can see the map okay. Okay, awesome. So uh, let's see, the Whale Center like uh, in Langley is right over here. You can see Seattle is down over here. Uh, and so Shy Shy Beach is way out on the outer coast at the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, right where the greater Pacific Ocean meets the Salish Sea. And if we zoom in and look at Shy Shy Beach, we can actually see that this beach is right on the south end of the Macaw uh, Indian Reservation. And so the Macaw are the people who, who have stewarded the lands of the western tip of Washington state since time immemorial. And so they have been uh, around protecting these lands and waters as long as there have been people in western Washington, which is pretty cool. And right now, this land is closed to just people who live there to try and protect the tribe, tribal community from COVID. And so back in December uh, or November, a tribal member was down on the beach. And you can see kind of the lovely sea stacks uh, and arches in the picture over here. Hold on, let me move this so you can actually see it. Um, this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful beach. Uh, but this is full of nice sand to rest on, uh, but it's also pretty rocky. So there's all kinds of different habitat there, and those are good for the animals that want to live there. But does anybody remember what part of the world uh, do green sea turtles like to live in? Is it where it's kind of cool, like in the Salish Sea where it was 50 degrees, or is it somewhere else? You can put your answer in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Shallow, cool, Hawaii. Somebody learned about them in class. Kenji is saying further south. Yeah. So generally they like warmer water. Um, and there can be sea turtles here in Washington, but usually they're way out over here, out in the open ocean of the so when Shasha washed up on this beach, she wasn't very happy. Um, 
she was what we call cold stunned. So Tiffany mentioned that a bit earlier and talked about how sea turtles um, uh, are able to, uh, can't regulate their temperature, right? So their insides are always the same temperature as the water around them. And so uh, they need to be pretty warm to be able to move pretty fast because muscles and all those other things, they work better when they're warmer or they work quicker when they're warmer. So in us, or in like a seal, which are the other animals that we take care of here at our hospital, uh, we're always making heat to keep our muscles and our brains moving really fast. But sea turtles don't do that. They rely on the ocean to keep them warm so that their muscles move. And so Shai Shai uh, got really cold and was all stiff and couldn't control herself very well and washed up on this beach. And because the, um, the, tribe was closed, there was only one person down there. So it was a very, very lucky chance that someone showed up at that beach. And when they found her, uh, he knew that she wasn't supposed to be there. So he called the tribal biologist. The tribal biologist came down to the beach, figured out that she was still alive, and they needed a way to get her back because it's a two mile hike from the road to the beach where she was found. And so they had to move her somehow. And there's no way to get a car down there. And she weighs about 50 pounds. So what they did was they took some rope and they essentially made her into a backpack and hooked her onto the back of the guy who found her. And then he hiked her 45 pound weight all the way up those two miles up the beach. And then what uh, was going on at the time was there were some pretty severe storms. And so there was a landslide on this road out here. And so no one could drive out to the Makah Reservation at Nia Bay. So not only did they have to hike her from the beach up to the town, once she got to the town, there was no way to drive in and get her and bring her to the hospital. So what we did was someone was flying supplies for the store in Nia Bay from the town of Port Angeles. So they got in a plane and took off and flew all the way out to Nia Bay and landed and they dropped off the supplies that they usually drop off at the store. So they dropped off some Cheetos and maybe some flour. Uh, and then they picked up a sea turtle and Shai Shai got put in the plane and flown all the way back to Port Angeles where we met her uh, with our ambulance and picked her up and then drove her all the way down to Seattle. So there's this really incredible uh, set of chances that helped her get to us. But it's kind of funny, like, why was she here in the first place? And where did she come from? So Shai Shai, being a green sea turtle, is from much further south. She was probably born in a place called Estado de Michoacan, which is in Mexico. And uh, she was probably born on one of the beaches somewhere along here. And um, the, oh, I'm sorry, right along here. I got my borders wrong. <laughs> uh, and she moved out into the open ocean to find food, uh, like we talked about before. And some of her lost years would have been out in the open here. So this is um, something really, really cool. This is uh, an app called Null School. And what you see is in the background, you're seeing the temperature of the water and red is warmer and yellow is cooler than red, green is cooler than yellow, and blue is the coolest. And then on top of the temperatures, you're seeing the currents that flow through the ocean. And these are real time currents. So you're actually seeing what's going on uh, over the last few months right now, which is pretty neat. So when Shai Shai was born, she was in this dark red area where it was really, really warm. And she would have shot out into the ocean as quick as she could to try and get away from all those crabs and seagulls and other creatures that were trying to eat her and would have made her way into these currents. And these currents are really great because they push you along so you don't have to work as hard while you're finding food. Now, you want to stay warm when you're a sea turtle, but you also want to find food. And like Tiffany told us, the baby sea turtles are eating a big mix of food. Uh, it's not just um, seagrasses when they're little, it's all kinds of open ocean animals. 
And the places where open ocean animals gather together, which is what we call congregating, tend to be places where warm and cold water meet. So you can see this uh, or green circle here. This is a really cool spot uh, where you can see this colder water is meeting up with this warmer water. And so Shai Shai probably rode some of these currents that we can see on the screen all the way out over here. And uh, this edge where the cold and the warm meet grows in the summer. And so it drifts to the north because the sun beats down on the earth and it pushes the water warms and that pool of cool water or warm water pushes up north. So she would erode this edge and then in the fall would have tried to ride it back. But then something happened in the fall uh, and I'm going to change one thing on here and we're going to switch from being able to see currents on the surface of the earth to being able to see the wind at the surface of the earth right now. And so where you can see Shai Shai would have been at the border and probably even a little further north uh, is kind of in this open area here. And you can see right now, there's a lot of very strong wind pushing from this boundary up to the coast of Washington. And sea turtles breathe air, so they have to sit at the surface a lot. And so if there's a lot of wind and it's always pushing in one direction, every time they come up from a, for a breath, they get pushed a little bit further that way. And then when we get really, really strong storms, which are called atmospheric rivers, which form out here in the Pacific and then blow uh, storms straight at Washington State, those push sea turtles inland. So she probably ended up over this way because of that. And that led to um, her becoming cold stunned when she blew into this cool water that we see up here. So what that actually looked like is uh, here's Shai Shai when we first picked her up at the in our ambulance. Um, and you can see a few different things going on with her cold stunning. Um, she's not, this is just a still picture, but she wasn't moving very much because her body was really slow. And then you can see here's her hard shell, here are her scales and her flippers and her head. And this softer skin under here, you can see has lots of scratches and it looks kind of puffy. Has anybody ever had it um, when you get sick and like your cheeks get kind of puffy or you get an ear infection and it feels like the inside of your ear is pushing on itself? So if you ever feel that, that's called inflammation. And it usually happens when your body is trying to protect you, but it can also happen because you have like um, liquid inside your body. And so she had some extra liquid next to her shoulders. And so those scratches were something that we uh, wanted to try and treat. And that's what we could see on the outside. But a lot of the things that happen to a sea turtle when they get cold stunned are problems on the inside. And we can't do that just looking at uh, her from this. So we have to use special tools. And one of the tools that we used, we brought her down to the Seattle Aquarium and we were able to use an ultrasound machine. And uh, an ultrasound machine is really cool. Some of you may have seen it if you have little siblings. Um, when, you're, when babies are inside their mom's tummies, you can use a special wand that shoots out sound that goes very fast. And the way the sound bounces back off of the inside of your body shows you a picture. So that's what we're doing here is we have a little wand pointing into her body and sending sound waves into her shell and showing us all of her organs so we can look at her heart. We can actually watch it in real time. It's really cool. And her heart beats really, really slow. So our heart goes uh, 60 beats a minute usually. So that's one every second. So that's do, 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 do. But her heart beats anywhere between 20 and 50 times a minute. So it's more like do, It's really cool. And if you look, uh, the vet, you when you do an ultrasound on a person, you usually go straight into their belly. So you would hold it up right there and point it at the organ you want to look at. So if you want to look at their stomach, you point it at their stomach. But because sea turtles have a hard shell, we can't do that. The sound won't penetrate the shell. So we have to point it through the sea turtle and try and look in a little area at all of that. And so this is Dr. Caitlin, who works at the Seattle Aquarium. Uh, and was helping us get Shai Shai warmed back up first, uh, doing what we call an initial assessment. So 
a first look at the animal. And if we can't find anything on an ultrasound, there's other tools we can use. We can also do x-rays. Has anyone had an x-ray before? Uh, raise your hand or use a chat um, or say something in the chat if you've had an x-ray before. Yeah, we got a couple of them, cool. Yeah. You had one? Yeah. Did you get, yeah. Isn't it cool how you get to see your bones? And this is a really good example um, of the bones in the carapace, so the top part of Shai Shai's shell. And this is looking from her head to her tail. And so you can see how those ribs that Tiffany told us made up the shell, they're right here. So the spine comes down and then the bottom of the spine actually flattens out and then the ribs meet up with it and spread out uh, and make the structure of the top of the shell. And these two white dots you can hear, see here are actually pretty neat. These are veins. And because we're looking down them, uh, they're filling up the whole space. And then this image actually shows us something really neat that's kind of sad, but um, Shai Shai has gotten a lot better from. Uh, she had pneumonia, which is an infection in her lungs. And we can see that because uh, the area right here is her lungs. You can see there's no bones in the way. It's just clear open space. But this space in a healthy sea turtle should be much darker. It should look more like this. And with this kind of white cloudiness, that means that she is having um, an infection. So there are bacteria living inside her lungs. And she's actually gotten a lot better from this. This has um, gone away. So when we take x-rays now. And then another thing that we learned on the x-ray was that she had some broken bones. So I'm gonna move uh, this guy so that you can see it a little better. But you can see this is her right side and put this right in the way. Um, this is her back right leg. So you can see here's her hip, here's her knee, here's her ankle, and then her flipper sticks out here. And she has the same bones in her back flippers as you do in your feet, which is pretty cool. Uh, and you can see her tail hanging down over here. And then uh, right up here, where you see my cursor sliding along the screen, this is a break. So this is a fracture, just like if you were to break your arm or a wrist or your nose maybe. Um, and this is in her plastron. So that's the shell on her belly. And these breaks um, can be really painful. So she gets some medication right now to help her feel better. Um, but this is also healing really, really well. And sea turtles are specially evolved uh, to be able to do that. So we've been doing all kinds of work to treat Shai Shai. Uh, and I'm going to show you how she's doing now. And you go ahead and in the chat, tell me, do you think she's doing better or uh, worse than when we first saw her in that picture? Better. <laughs> yeah, you can see if you look at her flippers, that soft tissue is shedding some old skin, just like you might if you have a cut or a scar. And it's not all red and scratched anymore. She's swinging her flippers really strongly and swimming about in the water. Uh, and then uh, you can also see she's shedding a lot of skin on her shell. Her shell is coated in skin and she actually has nerves in there so she can feel it when you touch her shell. Uh, and that shedding skin is a good sign that her insides are doing really well. Uh, and we had her in a little tent so that we could keep her nice and warm while we we're out. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I know uh, I use a lot of time. Um, so if we still have time to run out and say hi to Shai Shai, we can do that. I'll switch over to my phone, but I wanna leave it uh, to the Orca Network folks to let me know. <laughs> no, I think we definitely should go see. We've got time. Okay, great. I'm gonna turn off my video here. All right, can you all see me on my phone now? Oh, can everybody see me on my phone now? Perfect, okay, I'm gonna throw my mask on because I'm gonna go elsewhere. Oh. And I'll try to talk really loud. Uh, so we're gonna go from my office out to the pool, which is out this window. And we'll watch, walk through our fish kitchen too while we do it. So you can see some of the kind of cool stuff that we have here at our hospital. 
Uh, but does anybody have any questions while we're walking out there? This is a really great time to ask. How big is the pool? Oh, you know what? Sorry, my phone was muted. Could you ask that again? <laughs> how big is the pool? And Ooh, how many it's animals live there. How many what? How many animals go there? So right now, Shai Shai's in uh, our larger pool, which is 12 feet across. So it's a big circle and it's four feet deep. And if that sounds a little small for a sea turtle that likes to live in the open ocean, it makes sense. Uh, but the, with uh, animals who are in a hospital, we wanna keep things a little smaller so that they don't accidentally run around and hurt themselves. And so that's why that's that pool. And she's in there by herself because um, sea turtles are pretty solitary most of the time. And I'm putting my feet in a sanitizer bath so that they're nice and clean when I go in there. <clears throat> and, uh, but this pool, when we have baby harbor seals in it, can have up to 10 animals. In there. So it can be quite a lot. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna switch up over to a forward facing camera and we'll go take a peek. And we're pretty lucky. She's actually at the surface right now, which is awesome. Ooh, that was a really good breath. One of the things that we watch for when we're taking care of Shai Shai is how good her breathing is, because it's really, really important to make sure that she's getting enough air. And you actually kind of learn what a turtle breath sounds like. And it's funny because it sounds a little bit like a flute because her nostrils, the holes in her nose, are um, these, uh, they're straight holes through hard beak. And so they make a really distinct Kind of. What kind of sea turtle is she? Sound when she takes a breath, it's pretty. Cool. Oh, that's right. She's a green sea turtle, and it's how she's so dark. She's that really black color, but she's called the green sea turtle. Um, green sea turtles got their name because the fat inside their body is bright green. It's really cool. And um, Tiffany was telling us about how sea turtles are often have a blacker coloration. And those are the sea turtles that live in the Eastern Pacific, like Shai Shai. So the, the turtles from Michoacan tend to be a little darker. And then also she's still young. She's probably only seven or eight years old, uh, which I think some of you are too. So that's pretty cool. Um, and that is what we would call a juvenile. So she's kind of a kid or a teenager. Uh, and still some of the same color that she had when she was first uh, born because the baby sea turtle, baby green sea turtles are black on top and white on their belly. Oh, that's younger than you, Eric. right now there's a little bit there's kind of a box this is her little cave because if you look at her you can see her head is kind of her softest body part and it would be really bad if she got bit on the head right that's just kind of not good at all um so what sea turtles will very often do in the wild is they will their, their head stuck in a cave in the coral or under rocks and so what we did was we made an artificial cave, a fake one, so that she could go there and feel safe. Kind of like you would use maybe a blanket to put over your head when you're scared. So hers is made up, it works just the same. And I think she's gonna go in and take a nap. So that would be a great time to give her a little bit of a break. Switch back over to this camera. And then say goodbye. So everybody want to wave bye to Shy Shy? See ya. Bye, Shy Shy. We love you. Oh, great question. <laughs>
Uh, I saw a question about how warm her water is. Uh, it's between 75 and 80 degrees. So it changes a little bit over the day. It gets warmer and colder as time goes on, as our heaters work <laughs> and don't work. Um, so she's in a nice temperature for getting better. And I also saw another question about when she's gonna be ready to be released. So she's still uh, a little sick. She still needs some help. So we're working on that. Uh, and we think probably she will be able to go down to San Diego in uh, the end of the month. We're hoping maybe by the first week of February. And once she's in San Diego, she'll hang out at SeaWorld San Diego for a little while in a really big pool that they have that's full of a bunch of sea turtles. And when she's there, uh, she'll continue to eat and grow nice and strong. And then in the summer, when it's nice and warm out in the ocean for her, she'll be able to uh, go out to the wild again from a boat. So we're hoping she'll have a successful story and she's been doing really well and she's definitely a fighter. She's very, very strong. Um, so as things continue to improve, we'll continue to share, people, uh, share with people what's going on and hopefully we'll get her down there soon. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was so fun <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Does anybody else have any more questions for Patrick? Why do um, they hunt sea turtles? That's a really good question. So a lot of um, a lot of sea turtle hunting comes from a few different things. Um, it can depend on Sea turtles live in places where a lot of people don't have a lot of money for food or the only way they can get food is to get it from the wild. Uh, they don't have a grocery store that's really close to them. And so they need to eat something and sea turtles are pretty easy to catch when they're, especially when they're on the beach. Uh, and they have a lot of fat in them. And so they have a lot of nutrients. And so for some folks, it's that they're just trying to survive and they may have, their family may have eaten sea turtles for thousands and thousands of years, but there were lots of sea turtles in the past. And so it wasn't as big a deal. And then other people do take them for their shells um, because they want to make money off of it, which is pretty crummy if you think about it. Um, but it's a big mix of things. And in some cases, it's just things that um, are really important to people culturally. So like there are certain foods that um, we in the United States that we think of as like really, I would, it would be hard not to have it, right? Things like turkey at Thanksgiving or um, uh, corn on the cob during the summer, right? There are other foods that are really important in other places and turtle eggs and turtle soup can be one of those really important foods to people. So it can be hard to get people to give things up even if they're trying to help, if, even if they care about animals, if it impacts how they live. So that's part of it. How far away is the resort? How far away is what? Um, the hospital. Oh, uh, so we're in Des Moines, Washington. So if you uh, live in Seattle, we're just about a half an hour south of Seattle. Or if you're in Tacoma, we're uh, like 15 minutes north of that. Or if you're out on the islands at all, we're just a quick ferry ride away. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, Washington? Mm -hmm. Washington State, yep. How many animals have you helped in the hospital? Oh, great question, yeah. So we have helped, um, We the hospital has only been open for one year. This is our first year of operation, actually. And in that time, we've already helped over 40 different animals. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty solid. <laughs> Great question, thank you. All right, I don't hear anybody else piping up. I did just post in the chat a link to our YouTube channel where all of our youth events will be, but this one will also be on there. So if you want to share it, um, I do. Oh, there is a hand, Everett or Isaac, did you have a question? Go ahead. So, um, how do you, um, 
sea turtles. Um, how did the sea turtle get hurt? Oh yeah, so those scratches on her shoulders. How did that happen? Yeah, so that's probably that's probably what we call an abrasion, um, which is a really cool scientific word that means essentially like a scrape. So you know when you're uh, running and playing and you fall and you scratch your knee on the ground, that's called an abrasion, and that's because uh, the ground is rough and so it scratches the surface of your skin. Uh, and what happened with Shai Shai was probably when she was on the beach that she was named after, she was rolling around in the waves because she wasn't able to control her body very much. And if you go to a really sandy beach that's out near the open ocean, that sand gets blown around a lot by the water. It's moving constantly. And so it's rubbing against your skin. And so she was probably in the water, in the cold long enough that that was constantly scraping on her skin. Uh, so it's not something you have to worry about when you're just going to the beach and hanging out, but because she was cold, she couldn't repair her own skin very well, and uh, she was there for a long time. That's probably where those scratches came from. <clears throat> Any other questions? I'm looking for hands now. Oh, Kenji, do you have a question? Oh, okay, now you can try. So... Um, how can such tiny smashed up rocks scrape her for mm. if she's in there for a long time and they're so tiny? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. So um, small things can add up, right? So like if you, if you go to the beach or you, you go to a sandbox and you pick up sand, and you hold it and you run it between your fingers. I really encourage you to do this the next time you're at a sandbox or at a beach and just roll it back and forth. And when you do, you'll feel um, the kind of small sharp points on each little grain of sand. And when there's a lot of those together, that's when you start to get the scratches, but it takes a lot of time. Like if you just run sand over your hand, it's fine, it'll just bounce off. But if you put a lot of pressure behind that, a lot of force or energy from the waves and then lots of it going back and forth over and over again, uh, it'll cause that to be scratchy. And actually, if you've ever used sandpaper before, that's a really good way to uh, see this too. That's just sand glued onto paper. And so what you can do is you can rub it on wood and that will cause the wood to become very, very smooth because it abrades, it scrapes away the surface layers of the wood the same way the sand scraped Shai Shai's skin. That's a really great question, Kenji. Thank you. Lots of great questions, guys. Well, for the first time ever, we spent more time learning and less time on an activity. So I think since our activity extraordinaire, Jeannie, is actually not able to be there today, um, that'll be a home activity. And you probably already know all the answers, so I don't even have to check with you. I've got Percy showing their answers. That art on the top, that sea turtle, Jeannie actually drew that herself. She teaches art classes. So that's a one of a kind sea turtle. All right, does anybody else have any last questions or comments? And I think that we are done for the day. I just wanna thank um, both Tiffany and Patrick again for an awesome first time ever debut of sea turtles on Langley Whale Center Youth Events. This is the first time we've ever done a sea turtle talk. So thank you guys so much. And thanks for coming, everybody. And we will see you in February. I'm not, we are not entirely sure. We have a couple of different- Adios. Adios. Adios, yeah. Tenga buen noche. Oh, goodness, that's awesome. Adios. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Keep checking our Facebook page. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, Patrick. Bye. That was amazing. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. <laughs>